we are pleased to have Dr. Dreitzer with us this evening to share his inside knowledge of the Soviet media as well as uh, his expertise on knowing how America is seen by Russians. Appropriately, the title of his lecture this evening is Russian Views of America, Mass Media and Folklore. Dr. Dreitzer. Um, first of all, I wanted to apologize. I'm brought here not as a Sovietologist. I don't know much from scholarly point of view how to render the knowledge about the Soviet Union. It's rather first-hand knowledge, which is not scholarly usually. <coughs> you have to get second-hand to become scholarly, right? <laughs> Uh, you can't, they can't hear you there. The microphone is... That microphone is for the, uh, for the camera. For the camera. So oh, okay. I have... All right. I did not get a uh, microphone because it... All no problem. Okay. I just didn't know. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it loud. Uh, but at the same time, I did spend in the Soviet Union 36 years of my life. The first 36, not the second. <laughs> and uh, obviously, some uh, things I might know about how Russians see America. But I have to say that for myself, it was really a puzzle. Can we say in, in just in one sentence how Russians see America? And the answer is no. And when we look back uh, to the beginning of this century, we would see very strange views of America, very unexpected from what we customarily uh, feel the attitude towards America should be among, let's say, Russian intellectuals. Well, most of you, uh, I'm sure, know that Russia was a backward country in relationship to, to America of that time. and. Probably one would expect that leading Russian intellectuals who were radical in their thinking, who called for improving the condition of Russian people, uh, for change, radical changes in the society, that they would come to America and see some things that they would like to take back to Russia to change the social order of things. But believe it or not, by and large, it didn't happen. By and large, leading Russian intellectuals coming to America found mostly faults. Mostly they said, no, we don't want things like that in Russia happen. Well, even back in the time of Dostoevsky, one of his novels, uh, Idiot, I believe it's in the audio, Idiot, the Idiot, um, view of America is, uh, of course, rendered as a view of one of the characters, and she said, coming from the West in general, and from America in particular, that it's a very materialistic country, there's a lack of spirituality, there's a lack of positive kind of feeling uh, to our humanity, and so on. So, no, America was condemned. Now, the leading proletarian writer, Maxim Gorky, I'm sure most of you recognize the name, came to America in 1906. He stayed six months in the United States, mostly in New York, and as a result of it, he published uh, several uh, sketches. One of this is called City of the Yellow Devil, which means New York. <laughs> and the Yellow Devil is a dollar. So what he saw in America was that exactly what Russian uh, workers and Russian peasants shouldn't follow. So he was full of sentimental declaration of Russian superiority. Despite Russian social backwardness, he saw that this particular backwardness in time will send the Russian people way above and in front of Americans because they are too down to the ground to grab the dollar. That was his opinion. But interesting enough, 
that when we talk about writing of minor writers, of people of not that international standing as Maxim Gorky, we see a different picture. There will a lot of uh, sketches published in Russian periodicals about life in America, all the way positive. And as a matter of fact, from 19, from the beginning of the century, for another 14 years, 160,000 of ethnic Russian emigrated to the United States, believing that that's the future for them and their families, mostly peasants mostly unskillful workers. And they, by and large, were successful in settling in America. Now, when revolution started in Russia, in 1918, Lenin saw and believed that in a short period of time, American workers will follow Russian workers, will overthrow the capitalist system, and will join in the world revolution. Well, it didn't happen. Lenin said that America is a country of multimillionaires and capitalist sharks. But he admitted, so far it is the freest and the most civilized country in the world. He was marveled by the economic and technical achievements of America. But he said, we have to make America here same technical and economical achievements have to, be, have to be reached in Russia, but without the capitalist system, on the grounds of socialism. So American inventiveness and the in practical and technical matters actually in Russia was proverbial from the time Russians have learned about Franklin and Fulton. Any Russian would know that about Edison's phonogra phonograph, about Bell's telephone, about Otis elevator, about Kodak's camera, and so on. It captured Russian mind. As a matter of fact, much later, even up to these days, Russians would wonder how come Americans didn't cure cancer yet? <laughs> they are good at everything. That kind of a vision. <coughs> well, at the same time, Lenin claimed that America is actually the chief obstacle to the world revolution. And, because, uh, and it is uh, a country where there is uh, appalling unemployment and poverty. And there is a waste of human labor side by side with unprecedented luxury of multimillionaires. So Lenin predicted that after the World War I, American workers will be with us, means with the Soviets, for civil war against bourgeoisie. Now, later on, in 1925, a leading Russian revolutionary poet, Vladimir Mayakovsky, who admired everything American before he visited America. <laughs> Everything what he seems to be the most advanced, the machinery, the uh, tempo of life, the achievements of every side of... So Russia was seen so much backward. We have to rush forward to things that America have. When he came to this country, he stayed here for a couple of months. It was summer. It was summer heat in New York, if you know what I mean. He didn't know any Western language. He was lonely. He found cities dirty. People absorbed in the chase of a dollar. Again, nothing changed for 20 years since Gorky. And he found spiritual poverty. And he, one of his poems, he said something, I came over thousands of miles just to come back in time in 100 years back into our Konotop, which is a small town in Ukraine, it means it's a symbol of, of backwardness in terms of spiritual values. But America was still something to admire for general population. The image of America was very strong and very attractive. 1933, as you know, 
the first time a relationship between Russia and the Soviet Union had been established. And uh, American diplomats who resided in Moscow found astonishing that the view of America from our there, from Moscow, from other cities of Russia, was absolutely unbelievable. It was the most idolized country in the world in Russia. America stood for competence, responsibility, punctuality, accuracy, diligence, inventiveness. Americans represented youth and uh, invincibility, the triumph of the machine and the mass production. At that time, of course, you know, Ford started to put out his machines and so on and so forth. 1924, Stalin, in one of his speeches, again hymned American efficiency from purely technological, economical point of view. And it's no, it's no coincidence that there have been 3,000 American engineers working in Russia in the 30s when, when the, the so-called five-year plan started to be implemented. So technology, American technology was used in two-thirds of the new plants built at that time in the Soviet Union. Every, from three pieces of, of uh, machinery, two were from America or designed by American engineers. Well, first of all, let's ask ourselves a question. Why Americans? Why not Germans? Why not Englishmen? Well, there are several reasons for this. One is there was actually no ancient hostilities toward Americans as it were to Germans and to Englishmen. They never fought against each other, right? Secondly, real or imaginary similarity in climate, size, national character. Yankees seem to be ingenious, energetic, open, and it's much better, of course, than the stiff and class-conscious Englishman or the deliberate and sometimes overbearing German in Russian view. Okay? In 1936, two famous Russian writers, Ilfim Petrov, have traveled to America and they have published a book which is titled One Story at America. And it's up to this time, I believe, is the most objective view of America. Well, of course, from the, as, as, you, see, as you see it from, uh, if, you, if you review all other writings of America by Russians. <coughs> Yet, Yes, they said about, they, they noticed some vulgar advertising, they make fun of Hollywood movies, and so on. But they have shown people of America being energetic, efficient, hospitable, true to, true to the world, which was in very, I would say, strong contrast to the Russian life of that time. Now the World War II started. And the relationship, of course, we all know, the first period of time was not clear where Americans would stand, obviously, against Germans, but when, when the second, the second front will open and so on. It come, comes already to my time frame, and I remember Studebaker trucks from America, jeeps and Willises, American canned pork, and a lot, and other canned food which was sent in Russia in huge quantities. So the overall feeling in Russia was of that time, now when America is so obviously on our side, we should win, we will win, there is no doubt about it. The mighty America, the generous America is on our side, the generous America. So there is no question we will win. Well, of course, you know that after World War, World War II, uh, with the development of atomic bomb, America was pronounced enemy number one. And all the attributes of all the negative epithets about n Nazi Germany was now transplanted, moved to America. America was seen as the evil of the world. To the extent that everything that reminded America was forbidden. You won't believe it, 
but the word jazz that that uh, traveled into Russian language by that time was per forbidden to use. Jazz. Okay. The state there was a state orchestra uh, by um, with the director of famous Russian. Uh, I would call him Russian Sinatra. This is as famous Utyosov. So his orchestra was renamed from Jazz Orchestra to the <coughs> State Variety Orchestra. That's it. <laughs> there have been shot several movies, like anti-American uh, movies, like Conspiracy of the Doomed. And it's, um, with any political movies, it's very hard to spend enough time, I mean, to, to go and, and watch it, because it's so heavy-handed and obviously far from being artistic. But at that time, luckily enough, uh, there have been numerous uh, showing of American movies that were, uh, were captured as a trophy in Nazi Germany. Movies with Dina Durbin, movies with Errol Flynn, <laughs> Tarzan. I saw as a, chi as a child, oh, well, we have not, not 13 series, but I think it was like six or seven have been shown in Russia. Obviously, movies by Chaplin and so on. Now, after Stalin's death, things, of course, change for better. An attempt have been made, probably the first time, to, st to start to see America more objectively. Um, well, uh, we started to read in the Soviet newspapers things like that there are two camps within the ruling classes the ruling circle. <coughs> One cap is uh, more rabid proponents of the Cold War. Another one is more far-sighted representatives of the imperialist ru ruling circle. So the far-sighted means they saw further, they saw there is no gain in being anti-Soviet, right? So in this area of political um, coverage of the relationship, at least two colors appear after one, I have to realize. And of course with the tent, things started to change. But it might surprise some of you, if you don't, didn't follow the Soviet press, that even of the height of the tent, Russian papers kept writing about America, that is, it's a doomed society. At the time when Khrushchev said that we will overrun America within a decade by production per capita, capita. the same time when the Soviet Union wanted to improve trade with the West, to, find, to, to, to buy some technology from the West and so on, in the same time the newspapers in the Soviet Union kept writing about lack or loss of ideals among Americans, loneliness in the, midst, in the midst of the crowds, individualism that is doing no good to American people, dictatorship of bourgeoisie, ignorance of school system, sens sensationalist press, dangerous highways, organized violence, killing progressive people, crisis of nation spirit, what was seen in a tragedy of the uh, Johnstown massacre, if you remember, of course. Yes. So it was in the same time wha when there was obviously better relationship, at the same time when uh, some cultural groups from America uh, came to, to Russia. 1962, Benny Goodman traveled to the Soviet Union and I attended one of his concerts in Kiev. Uh, at that time, we, we have seen uh, American ballet, first time. Jeffrey Ballet traveled to Russia. We have seen some uh, orchestras, symphony brought from America and so on. Nevertheless, there was, a, there was a fear in the ideological echelons of the party that it, that might be contagious, that might be not too good for people to see that after all, America is not such a complete desert in terms of culture. They have something that uh, Russians can admire. So Pravda 
would write at the same time that America is a society without future, would cite numerous ac uh, uh, incidents of racism, would talk about mass repression, about economic decline, uh, would show Negro children dying of hunger, uh, which would talk, uh, would uh, publish stories about illiterate Indians, would say that there was a cartoon in, in Crocodile that uh, uh, the judges are actually, wh whenever they decide any case where a black man is involved, uh, they, they are, uh, uh, they are actually Bible is the, uh, the, uh, the codex of KKK. In other words, that they are not much better than KKK to that extent. They would write about powers of the uh, America's Fortune 500 companies. And Pravda wrote in 1974, the crisis in the United States is growing steadily worse. And I have heard it for 36 years. <laughs> and worse and worse and worse and worse. And there seems to be no end to this worse, right? Somehow America managed to survive. But to explain to the people why, if America is such an awful society, we won't still talk to them, trade with them, and, and try to make better relationship. It was stressed that there is an overriding necessity to avoid nuclear catastrophe. That's why we talk to America. That's why we have to make uh, some kind of relationship to prevent that kind of a world catastrophe. In, uh, in 1970, no, in 1968, in, 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 in the Soviet Union, the first, for the first time, an institute of study of United States and Canada was formed. And Arbatov, of course, you, you know this name if you watch Nightline, he often is there, represents the Soviet Union, was the head of this institute from, from that time. And Arbatov insisted that we have to really look closely to what happened to, to the United States so that we can be more effective when we talk to them. There is uh, the time of complete ignorance of, about the United States and trying not to see what's going on. It might be counterproductive. So he, he first time then uh, noted that objective conditions made it possible for many democratic demands in the United States to be implemented without waiting for fundamental social and political transformations. In other words, things have been done to improve the uh, population existence, not by revolution, which is the only way so far was seen on a Russian map. Only revolution can change all of this and bring changes into American life. But some other measures were, have been taken. Some reforms, reforms in American society have been done. So he tried to bring more realistic view of America. And the moment the, in the relationship between the Soviet Union and Russia is in improving, there are numerous uh, citations of instances of cooperation and mutual interest are recalled in the press. At the same time they write, remember the World War II, the Studebakers, the, uh, you know, the, all this uh, stuff. Roosevelt was praised of being far-sighted, that he wanted to improve relationship with, with the Soviet Union, and so on. Of course, the space race and the meeting in, of uh, Leonov and Stafford in space, if you remember, was of course added to this. And the first time for a long period of time, translation of major American writers uh, have been uh, available to, to the Soviet public. Uh, before that, the American writers we knew it was uh, Edgar Poe, Fenimore Cooper, and Jack London, and Mark Twain. And of course Dreiser, <coughs> Theodore Dreiser. Huh? Of course, in Sinclair Lewis. Okay, you might guess, right? Now, but in the 60s and 70s, translation of Ernst Hemingway, Scott Fitzgerald, Salinger, Thomas Wolf, and other writers were first translated, uh, I mean, appeared on, on the Russian, in the Russian uh, publications. And I have to say that Hemingway probably was more famous in Russia than in the United States. Absolutely. Every uh, house of, uh, you know, every apartment where uh, an intelligent person uh, is there would have a, a portrait of Hemingway right there. And obviously all the, you know, some, uh, the, the, uh, 
five or three volumes of his work were translated and, new, and every time anything appeared by him was immediately you know why the way the, I, I think about it, it because he exactly represented the image of American American as it was seen back in the 30s as being a strong man a hunter, a macho man, at the same time he's kind, the same, I mean, you know say, the same kind of image was behind this, uh, his writing. But at the same time, you have to realize, not everything was translated into Russia. And, the, and things that have been translated have been done very careful, so that, that nothing dangerous or not explainable right away could sneak into the Soviet press. For example, one novel of, of Abdike was translated, the Centaur, how do you say it in, in English? Centaur. Centurious, yeah. No, 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 no. Centurious. That's one but, but everything, but everything after that was not translated. The only thing we saw a uh, criticism about this novel, but they are not good, and he shouldn't, he should stop writing that kind of novel. Henry Miller was never translated. You know why, of course. <laughs> and so on. And even those things, they were translated, they were clips, cutting out several scenes uh, which were not ideologically uh, right away acceptable. So, that's the picture which probably... News items and how an event in American life would be presented in the mass media to the Soviet uh, readers. Again from the magazine Crocodile. It's a translation of an October issue of last year. A short kind of a article titled uh, A Gift to Your Mama. A new service is widely catered to the American public that every American must provide for his old mother. It is expressed in the advertising motto seen on many t-shirts and bumper stickers that reads Kill a communist for your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Having given the readership the impression of an ongoing communist hunt in the United States, the magazine then tries to inject a little humor. After all, it's a humorous magazine, right? <laughs> I translate. It's not clear what one should do afterwards to deliver the corpse of a communist as a present to one's mother's home or bring her to the scene of the murder so that she can rejoice in looking at it while it's still warm. <coughs> that kind of a humor. Okay? And it's only a beginning, they continue. In the near future, one could expect the proliferation of t-shirts calling for the murder for the same mother's happiness, not only of communists, but of all others who get on the nerves of the American reactionaries. For example, Dr. Benjamin Spock and actress Jane Fonda, and then the rest of the activists of the anti-war movement in the United States. Okay? One article. Secondly, a small item in the crocodile. At the same time as the whole world is sending 8 million hungry Ethiopians food and medication, Associated Press reports that American businessmen have sent to Ethiopia 50,000 pairs of shoes, golf sneakers and women's high heels. <laughs> Quoting Associated Press. Considering that there is no other information of American help to Ethiopia is available to the Soviet reader, he is prepared to draw the right conclusion on what a heartless people Americans are. So you understand how this is a new item, how he was handled to show how many money, how much money was sent to Ethiopia, only we know. They don't. There, the average Russian doesn't know the, the amount of the, the whole campaign through the whole country and so on. And that's how it is handled. But at the same time, I was surprised, despite all this barrage of propaganda for so many years, you won't probably find any Russian who would genuinely hate Americans. 
none. Still the image of American being open, honest, uh, workaholic, for that matter. See, Americans and a lazy doesn't meet in Russian consciousness. No, it, we Russians are lazy, not Americans. <laughs> okay? So the always is still up to this day, you never hear about that kind of a uh, perception of Americans as being totally negative and, and, and even near and close to what we, we have seen. And I spent some time collecting Russian underground humor and I have noticed that practically I don't know any of the item of this humor that would present an American as a being a negative, a negative uh, person. And as the United States there are sick jokes, there are black humor, everything. But in none of them American is shown as being negative. I'll give you some examples from, from the book. Whenever Americans appear appears in, in, the, in these items, he is in contrast to the Russian, and he is always in much better shape. <laughs> For example, President John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev ran a foot race. The next day, the Soviet newspapers published the following account. Our beloved Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev won a very respectable second place in the race. <laughs> <laughs> the American president barely managed to arrive at the finish line in the next to the last position. <laughs> <laughs> or, our goal, uh, said the party prop uh, propagandist, is to catch and overtake the most advanced capitalist country, the United States of America. Does anyone have any questions or suggestions? I do, said one worker. That's it, Petrov, said propagandist. Good man, you're, dis uh, you're displaying political activeness. Well, what's your suggestion? We should catch up with the United States, but not overtake him. And why not? So they don't, they don't want to see our naked ass. <laughs> <laughs> or after the Soyuz Apollo space flight, Leonid Brezhnev called to congratulate the cosmonauts. However, we also reproached them with, the Americans are winning the space race. We must accomplish something to outdo them. They have already landed on the moon, so we in the Politburo have decided to send you for a landing on the sun. <laughs> so the cosmos have grown, but Comrade Brezhnev will be born alive. We, what do you think, interrupted Brezhnev, that we don't understand anything? Don't worry, we have already planned all the details. First of all, you're going to complete the landing at night. <laughs> Thank you for attention. <laughs>